Hi, I'm Phil Constantine with Travels with Phil. This video is from the Vicksburg National Military Park, the scene of one of the biggest battles in the American Civil War. Now, I'm going to be using several videos from the National Park Service. Unfortunately, the quality is very poor, so the pictures are going to be very small. But this is a long video, but lots of material here from the National Park Service. On behalf of the National Park Service, an agency of the United States Department of the Interior, welcome to Vicksburg National Military Park. The park was established by the Congress in 1899 to commemorate the campaign siege and defense of Vicksburg during the American Civil War. Your tour begins by driving through the Memorial Arch, which will place you on the Union siege lines around the city. For the first eight miles of your tour, you'll pass the various monuments erected by northern states, and all the tablets are painted blue, denoting United States forces. It's not until the latter part of your tour, after you visit the USS Cairo Museum and the grounds of Vicksburg National Cemetery, that you'll see the monuments erected by the various southern states that were represented during the defense of the city, and also the tablets will be painted red, denoting Confederate forces. Vicksburg National Military Park is one of the more densely monumented battlefields in the world, boasting of more than 1,380 monuments, markers, tablets, and plaques. The monuments of stone and bronze that you shall see were executed by the foremost American and European sculptors of the late 19th, early 20th century and have made Vicksburg, in the words of one Civil War veteran, the art park of the world. For your safety and the preservation of this resource, we ask that you not climb on the cannons or the monuments during the course of your stay. Thank you. Now, most of the pictures you're going to be seeing here are the ones that I took. And this is a long road that goes through the park itself. It's about an eight-mile road, as I recall. You're looking at some of the battlements. Now, mostly you start off going through the Union uh, force lines. Those are lots and lots. There's, as you heard him say, over a thousand markers throughout the entire park out here. And this is just a fraction of beautiful flowers there, by the way, prairie nymphs. And you can just see there's such a wide variety of markers out here in the park itself. Some of them are short, some of them are tall, some of them have pictures of generals, some of them have listings of all the units involved. A few of them even have uh, uh, pictures of all or names, listings of all the soldiers that were involved in a particular operation. So it's just a really, really large, large park. Now we're going to go over to one of the large batteries here. Fittingly dominating the landscape here at tour stop number one is the obelisk erected by the state of Michigan that features the spirit of Michigan herself. For it was here that the guns of Captain Samuel de Gaulier's 8th Michigan Battery, along with guns from other federal artillery units, were positioned for battle. This is the largest concentration of cannon in Grant's siege lines around the city. During the course of the siege, there were 22 guns positioned at this location, almost all of which were smoothbore weapons. Being smoothbore weapons are limited in their range to about one mile. Thus, the forts that are the target of these guns, Great Redoubt and 3rd Louisiana Redan, are well within the range of these guns. And throughout the 47 days of siege, guns such as these would hammer away at the Confederate fortifications of Vicksburg and help compel the surrender of the fortress city on the Mississippi River. Now, around the park, you are going to see lots and lots of these cannons. And the one thing about this park is there are signs for just about everything. Lots and lots of pictures out there around the uh, various spots out here. This is Shirley House. I saw a lot of damage through there. And this is part of the Illinois Memorial, a, just a very, very large, impressive uh, monument here. Now, most of the uh, Union uh, northern states came in and did uh, markers very early. It took a long time for the economy to recover in the south for the southern states to come in and do markers. Uh, beautiful, just the Illinois, I was very impressed by it here. Had a large listing of all the personnel involved as well. Now outside, uh, this is the view from the front steps of the marker. The Jackson Road, off to my right, was the main thoroughfare leading into and out of the city of Vicksburg in the summer of 1863, and the direct road to the state capital of Jackson, located 45 miles distance off to the east. Guarding this major thoroughfare into the city were two powerful earthen bastions. On the north side of the road was the 3rd Louisiana Redan, a triangular shaped fortification apex facing the enemy. And off to the south where you see the tall shaft of the Louisiana Monument was Great Redoubt, which happened to be the largest and most formidable fort in the Confederate defense line around the city of Vicksburg. On May 22, 1863, Union troops of the 17th Army Corps stormed down the Jackson Road to attack these bastions. Although they succeeded in reaching the fortifications and plant their colors on the exterior slope of the forts, 
they were finally driven back with heavy loss. Throughout the course of the siege, Union fatigue parties working under the direction of engineering officers excavated 13 separate approaches toward the Confederate fortifications to gain access to Vicksburg via the road network. The most successful of these operations was here along the Jackson Road. Known as Logan's Approach, named in honor of Union General John Logan, a division commander, Union fatigue parties inched their way closer each and every day until finally by late June, they had reached 3rd Louisiana Redan. Excavating a gallery under the fort, they planted 2,200 pounds of black powder, and on the 25th day of June, the mine was detonated. Although battle raged in fury for 26 hours, as Grant sent in one fresh regiment after another, attempting to exploit the breach in the Confederate works, the assaults were driven back, the breach was sealed, the siege would continue. And again, I am using the National Park Service uh, narrations here because they have a lot more details uh, and more accurate details than it'd be easy for me to give. Now, this is a spot where they blew up an enormous crater. Fighting went on for over a day there. And even though Union forces had a lot of effort into it, they were not successful in storming the Confederate ranks. Some of these uh, markers are very, very tall. This is the Wisconsin one. And again, all across this area, you'll see signs here that say where a certain charge, where a certain effort took place. That was a young man, 14, that got the Medal of Honor. A lot of them, 123. Great, great grandfather, George Theodore Hyatt, who lived in Illinois, joined uh, the Union Army in Chicago and was uh, assigned to the 127th Illinois Volunteer Infantry. What we're going to talk about today is, in general, the assault that took place on the 22nd, but specifically about the Forlorn Hope. The term Forlorn Hope is kind of an interesting term. It actually comes from a Dutch term, Forlorn Hope. What that meant was not forlorn hope, but lost hope, or lost truth. You put the front rank a few paces ahead of your second and third ranks, and let them take the first volley. And those who volunteer for that front rank are the lost truth, or the lost hope, because they're going to disappear. General Sherman's plan was very simple. 150 men would carry planks and ladders to attack the fort. They'd be a vanguard and be supported by two regiments who would be immediately in their rear. Sherman sends out a call for volunteers. When Sergeant Hyatt was told you'll have to order others to volunteer, he said, I won't do such a thing. I won't order anyone on so perilous an assignment, but I will volunteer. Stock Avery Dan, as you can see, is directly in front of us on the graveyard road. Imagine this road quite a bit deeper and maybe half its width, as it would have been 150 years ago. On the morning of the 22nd, the guns have been firing since 5 o'clock to soften the defenses. Now, this is supposed to happen this morning at 10 o'clock along the entire front, all the way from McPherson's Corps to McClernand's Corps and including Sherman's Corps here. And this is probably about the point where you realize that of all those blue coats who are supposed to surge forward with you, you're the only ones moving. Now the casualties start to come fast. The man at your right probably goes down. Maybe the one at your left. You have to jump over bodies in front of you. This is the stockade redan. Theodore and a number of others, perhaps no more than 15 or 20, have got to the top of the wall and are pinned down by fire going from both directions. And they lie there the entire day. As night fell, the men on top of the wall and those here on the flanks realize this is their chance to escape. It's going to be their only chance, and they quietly leave the position on the wall and head back down the way they came. General Grant's planned assault has failed across the entire front. And it affected a lot of people in the city as well. In fact, they were living in caves along the bank of the Mississippi because this was a siege. So again, you see uh, lots of African-Americans were involved in this uh, particular battle, and they have their own separate uh, marker, a memorial out there on the roadways. New Hampshire marker, lots and lots of states. Uh, this is Grant's headquarters, and uh, you'll see a, a statue of him, and then have an old picture here of what it looked like from the actual time of the Civil War. Again, Thayer's Approach, the uh, well, first time Thayer's Approach, this is a famous spot where they actually dug a big tunnel underneath uh, to try and get to the area without being shot at. More uh, National Park 
commentary. The United States Navy Monument is the tallest monument in the park, towering 202 feet high, and was dedicated in October 1917 during the National Peace Jubilee. Patterned after the Washington Monument, the Navy Monument is adorned at its base by four heroic-sized statues of prominent naval officers who participated in the Vicksburg campaigns of 1862 and 1863. Those men were David Dixon Porter, David Glasgow Farragut, Andrew Hall Foote, and Charles Henry Davis. This imposing monument is a fitting tribute to the men of the United States Navy who played such a crucial role in the Vicksburg campaign. Just how crucial? On July 4, 1863, as Grant rode in to the city of Vicksburg at the head of his victorious Union Army and rode down to the Warren County Courthouse to watch as the stars and bars of the Confederacy were lowered to be replaced by the stars and stripes, he then rode down to the city's waterfront to personally thank and congratulate Admiral David Dixon Porter for the services rendered by the United States Navy, and Grant would be the first to admit he could not have taken Vicksburg without the Navy's assistance. And he is right. The uh, Navy Monument is very impressive. Uh, the uh, There's a lot of beautiful artwork in, involved in the statuary and the carvings here and engravements, engravings in a lot of spots. David Farragut has and damn the torpedoes full speed ahead. The U.S. Cairo is a armored, uh, clad, ironclad ship that's out there. And a very interesting cemetery with some very nice sayings of, uh, put around it. This is another old picture from the scene. And this is a spot overlooking the Mississippi, which is a very, very vital part. That's the whole point of the battle for Vicksburg, is control of the Mississippi River. And there's a view of it right from the banks. And now back to the National Park Service guide. You are standing overlooking Graveyard Road, one of the major entry points into the city of Vicksburg in the summer of 1863. To guard this and all other road entry points into the city, the Confederates constructed a rear line of defense that stretched for more than eight miles. It consisted of nine major forts connected by a continuous line of trenches and rifle pits. Ultimately, it would be manned by a garrison of 30,000 troops, mount 172 big guns, and posed a major obstacle to Union domination of the Mississippi River. Guarding the Graveyard Road entry point into the city was a complex of fortifications known collectively as the Stockade Redan Complex. A Redan is simply a triangular shaped fortification, the apex facing the enemy. It is constructed of earth and log. Also standing guard along this road was the 27th Louisiana Lunette. Off to your left where you see those three white stones in close order. A Lunette is simply a crescent shaped fortification. And off to your right where you see the tall shaft of the Missouri Monument was Green's Redan. These three forts would guard the Graveyard Road entrance into the city of Vicksburg and be the focal point of Union attacks by General William Sherman's Corps on both May 19 and 22nd of 1863. I noticed just by reading the signs at the, all over the park here, you can learn a whole lot about military terminology just by uh, reading the markers. See some of the beautiful artwork there. And again, we're going back over to the National Park the Service. to your right is the Stockade Redan massive earthen fortification that guarded the graveyard road entrance into the city of Vicksburg. If you take a short walk into the fort, you'll see this area of the battlefield from the Confederate perspective. On May the 19th, 1863, Major General William T. Sherman's 15th Army Corps advanced in typical battle array with man touching man, rank pressing rank, and line supporting line astride graveyard road. Down into the ravines fronting this work they poured here they encountered an obstruction of felled trees, referred to as abati. It was a 19th century equivalent of modern day barbed wire. In addition to the abati, the Confederates had excavated large pits at the bottom of which they placed sharpened bamboo and cane and covered those pits with mats of dried grass. Thanks to these obstructions, the Union advance was thwarted long before it ever reached its objective, this fort. In preparation for the attack on May the 22nd, Sherman realized that this obstruction had to be avoided at all costs, but the only open avenue of advance was straight down the road itself. And on May 22nd, as 150 volunteers, dubbed the Forlorn Hope, preceded the infantry attack, their objective was to reach the ditch fronting this work, throw down bundles of cane that could quickly be planked over, throw scaling ladders against the wall, and the infantry in its advance could simply race down the road, over the ladders, over the top of this fort, and gain access to Vicksburg. But as the volunteers reached the ditch and threw down their bridging materials, they were shocked to see that there were no troops behind them. 
the order was never relayed to the troops to advance. But when the troops finally advanced, they managed to reach this fort, plant their flags on the exterior slopes of Stockade Redan, but here were driven back by bayonet. By day's end, all along this abroad three-mile attacking front, Union soldiers were hurled, hurled back with a loss in excess of 3,000 soldiers. The siege of Vicksburg would begin in earnest. And indeed, it really was the siege works that almost did uh, most of the effort in far as uh, getting them surrendered. Now, in 1917, they had a big uh, peace memorial there. A lot of people came. Uh, it was actually sort of a reunion of sorts from both sides, Union and uh, Confederate sides attended. There's monuments out here to Jefferson Davis, lots and lots of journals. I have thousands of photos from here. You can go to my website to see all of them. But it is a significant collection, and it is very impressive if you're at all interested in the Civil War or warfare as far as that's concerned. You can see the pictures all on my website at uh, travelswithphil.com. And obviously, you can see my uh, videos uh, here on YouTube. Uh, that's uh, youtube.com, uh, Cherokee Phil, one word. And uh, again, just uh, some beautiful flowers out here, by the way. Now, this was the Iowa Memorial. I was very impressed by the artwork here as well. Uh, they did some very nice uh, bas relief, or even I'm not sure the technical term for it, but just a, a very, very impressive sculpting artwork here, uh, showing the various stages of uh, men in battle. Now this goes back to the big jubilee in 1917. In October 1917, approximately 8,000 veterans of the blue and gray, including about 300 black veterans, attended what was known as the National Peace Jubilee hosted here on what we call the South Loop of the Park. This was to be the Western Theater equivalent of the great reunion that had been held in Gettysburg in 1913 to commemorate the 50th anniversary of that particular engagement. As the United States had recently declared war against the Kaiser's Germany, military tentage was in short supply. Consequently, the tents had to be provided by the circus. One tent was large enough to accommodate more than 3,000 veterans. But two large messes were established to feed these veterans three meals a day that were actually prepared by gourmet cooks brought in from the city of New Orleans. The three-day event was a huge success, and with funding left over from that particular event, the Memorial Arch, which stands today at the beginning of our tour route, was constructed as a fitting tribute to these veterans who not only struggled here in the hot summer of 1863, but returned in peace as brothers in a nation once again united. The park itself is really quite pretty. Now, it wasn't this tree-filled and uh, picturesque during those days. And you can see from some of these actual pictures from uh, the, the battlegrounds themselves or just immediately after the fighting, uh, 123 medals of honor issued but during the conflict at Vicksburg. And that's what really got Grant uh, his uh, uh, promotion to being in charge of the Union Army was his victories here and in other places. Uh, these are John Pemberton. Uh, I appreciate your watching this long video. You can subscribe by pushing the button over on the right-hand corner. Leave comments below as long as they're family-friendly. Thank you very much for watching.